Okay, now that we've got our temples and a priesthood for the uh, newly restored Israelites, uh, the next thing we've got to do is to do what Joshua did on the land. Oh, thank you, Scott. Come on. And that is to uh, distribute the property. This distri uh, distribution of the property is going to be uh, very different from what you're used to reading in the book of Joshua and looking at the maps of the old uh, distribution of, of the tribal inheritances. And we got to Ezekiel 45 6. Uh, and this is the uh, gist of what that says. <clears throat> this property shown here, and, and it's, it's described in verses 1 through 7. Uh, as the property of the city set aside one to one and two thirds mile wide and eight and a third mile long, adjacent to the holy donation of land. It will be for the whole, wait a minute, I'm reading verse 6, I don't need to read verse 6, uh, I need to read uh, verse 1. When you divide the land by lot as an inheritance, you must set aside a donation to the Lord, a holy portion, and I know most of your Bibles have cubits, but we'll work it out. Uh, first one, set aside a donation to the Lord, a holy portion of land, eight and a third mile long, that's all the way across there, for the entire width of the donation, and six and two thirds miles wide, which is the height of the holy, of the whole holy portion that belongs to the Lord exclusively. This entire tract of land will be holy. In this area, there will be a square section for the sanctuary, and that is right in the middle there. Uh, it will be 875 feet by 875 feet, with 87 and a half feet of open space, a buffer around it. From this holy portion, you will measure off an area eight and a third miles long and three and a half miles wide, within which the sanctuary. Uh, the most holy place will stand. That's this section here. And let's see. It will be a holy area of the land to be used by the priests who minister in the sanctuary who draw near to serve the Lord. It will be a place for their houses as well as a holy area for the sanctuary. There will be another area eight and a third miles long and three and a half miles wide for the Levites uh, who minister in the temple, it will be their possession for towns to live in. And I think that brings us to verse 6. Yes. <clears throat> now, I think this is where we got to last Wednesday night. As the property of the city set aside one and two thirds of a mile wide and eight and a third miles long, uh, adjacent to the holy donation of land, it will be for the whole house of Israel. Down the bottom. And that includes, by the way, these two sections on the either side of it. Come on. Okay. And the prince will have an area on each side of the holy donation of land and the city's property. Adjacent to the holy donation and the city's property stretching from the west on the west side and to the east on the east side, its length will correspond to one of the tribal portions from the western boundary to the eastern boundary. The prince has a section on both sides of this is called the holy Donation, mostly in the center there, and the prince or leader, you may have the word leader there, 
which would be just fine. Uh, let's see. This will be his land as a possession in Israel. My princes will no longer oppress my people, but give the rest of the land to the house of Israel according to their promise. So, the city probably serves, I say probably, as its capital, but it is never given a name, which I find absolutely striking. You would think they would call it Jerusalem, but it's never named throughout Ezekiel's vision. Uh, that uh, city area is to be, uh, shall we say, communal property, not to belong to any of the tribes exclusively, but to all of the tribes together. Now, regarding the location of the temple, what else do you find very striking? The temple is not in the city. And to a Jewish person, for Ezekiel to have this vision of the glorious future of God's people and to have the temple outside the city limits of Jerusalem I find amazing on top of the fact that the name the city is not known which strikes me as very very unusual the Jews would probably have just scratched their heads and said how can this be? Remember, and before they took the land, God told them in the Old Testament that he would pick out a place. And I'll put my name there. Speaking of the city of Jerusalem, specifically speaking of the temple where he would dwell in between the cherubim and the Holy of Holies, and that's where he would take up residence. <coughs> but in Ezekiel's vision, Neither one of those things are true, which I find really amazing. <clears throat> okay, the prince in verse 7 is probably a civil magistrate, a civil ruler of some sort, uh, because the king, the <coughs> Jews didn't have any kings until what happened? <clears throat> Jesus came about 570 years later, 580 years later, they were without a king at all. Uh, kings they had been had been taken captive into Babylon. Uh, <coughs> verse 7 speaks of a holy donation. The actual translation of the word is a holy offering. Uh, I found one uh, source that says a more accurate translation is a compulsory contribution, which reminded me of what? Taxes. You're going to give this, whether you like it or not. But it was to be with the Lord's land in the first place. But he wanted it offered to him. Uh, now, the portion of the prince I think I forgot to mention this. Stretches all the way to the Jordan River on this side. I find out that there, the Dead Sea and the Arabah. Arab, Arab. And it goes east all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. In other words, from the east boundary of the territory all the way to the west boundary of the territory. So the French gets a rather large uh, section of property. Uh, uh, looking at verse 8, uh, this will be the prince's land as a possession. My princess will no longer oppress my people, but give the rest of the land to the house of Israel according to their tribes. Now, as far as I understand it, I don't think the kings were granted any land. Oh, is that the wrong one? Thank you. There we go. Uh, come here. And so, what, does anybody 
time remember a classic instance of a king deciding he wanted somebody else's property and took it. I'm sorry? Jezebel's husband. Ahab yeah. wanted the Naboth's vineyard, yeah. which was close to where he was living in Jerusalem. And uh, he cried and sulked and sulked and cried until Jezebel finally asked him, well, what's the problem? He wanted her that he wanted Naboth's vineyard. So she arranged it that Naboth was going to die. He did. And Ahab. Uh, Ahab took Naboth's property. Now, do you remember back in the, when the uh, children of Israel initially asked for a king? Samuel gave them this warning. He, the king you folks are asking for, will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. In other words, when you make a man king, he'll take what he pleases. Not only these uh, fields and vineyards and so forth, but your sons for military service, and you won't have a say in it. And so they agreed that that's what they wanted. But well, sometimes when it got right down to it, uh, they didn't want that. I didn't like that. Uh, now. This large allotment for the prince is given, I'm sure, for one main reason, so that he will not get greedy for land which has been allocated for other tribes or for other portions, as we showed you in the holy donation there. And uh, so that no new land could be added to the prince's allotments. These allotments were fixed and were going to stay that way forever according to Ezekiel's vision. Uh, so, the prince is going to have a nice piece of property, and he is to keep his hands off, off all other tribal territories and any territory there. <clears throat> now, this is a, a map of uh, Israel from the extreme north, which goes are actually down there and about right here. And here you see that portion we just looked at in that smaller map earlier. Okay, it lies right in the middle, and we're going to see the tribal allotments from the no here north and down here south. So here's the portion that we've been looking at in the first seven verses, just that central portion. That's all he's dealing with right now. And here it is on a regular map of how the land is going to be distributed under Ezekiel's instructions in his vision. Let's see, we looked at that. All right, let's go to verse 9. This is what the Lord God says, and he's speaking to the prince. Princess, you have gone too far, princes of Israel, put away violence and oppression and do what is just and right, put an end to your evictions of my people. This is the declaration of the Lord. I just gave you an example of that, and it had been done apparently on many other occasions, and we even in the book of Ezekiel, we read about the violence and oppression that was uh, throughout the city of Jerusalem at the time. So in verse 10 he says, you are to have honest scales, an honest dry measure, an honest liquid measure, the dry measure, which is an ephah, and the liquid measure, which is called a bath, appropriately enough, will be uniform with the liquid measure containing five and a half gallons and the dry measure holding half a bushel. Their measurement will be the tenth of the standard of larger capacity 
measure it. If that confuses it, it also confuses me every time I come back and reread it. But what he's saying is the dry measure and the liquid measure are going to be the same. They're going to be the same. Let's go ahead and read verse 12. Uh, the shekel will weigh 20 dirhams. Your mina will equal 60 shekels. Now we've gotten into the money part of it. Uh, but since he's in verse 9, he's speaking of the abuses of the princes or kings of Israel or their civil authorities. The first thing we're going to have to do, since we're going to learn that the prince is responsible for offering, providing, and having the priest offer many of the sacrifices. Some of the sacrifices can be offered by individuals, but most of them are going to be offered by the prince or provided by the prince. Now, if you're going to have the prince and the people providing all of these offerings, they're going to use the weights and measures and scales and so on and so forth to make sure that the prince gets everything he needs to provide the priest with the sacrifices. All right, the flour, the animals, everything involved. Now, the first thing you want in a situation like that is I want fair measurements. They didn't have a bureau of weights and measures back then at all. In fact, it was all pretty rough, and I guess it was on a lot of it. But the princes and the civil leaders and the kings often used cheated, is a better word, cheated the common people by using false measurements and weights to cheat the poor people. And so now the Lord is hopefully laying out what he wants to be the measurement standard for both liquid and uh, dry so that everybody will be fairly treated in this new system that's going to be set up in Ezekiel's vision. Uh, for instance, look at verse 11. Uh, I think some translations have the word, somebody look, verse 11, Homer, H-O-M-E-R. You know how they came up with the Homer? It was a donkey load. That's how they came up with it. Whatever a donkey could carry was a Homer. So that was an invitation for abuse. And of course, I give you the reason for the concern about the weights and measures is going to be uh, seen in when you get to verse 13. Now, this verse 12 is a mystery. Everybody has, to, all the translations have the first part of it the same. The shekel will weigh 20 euros. And then many of them have this. This, uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, this is the NIV. The shekel is the consists of 20 euros and then 20 shekels plus 25 shekels plus 15 shekels which is one minute, which it doesn't. Which it doesn't. Okay, so I have not read or found anywhere an explanation that makes any sense to me. So what did my translation do? It left it out. Okay? because it didn't make any sense at all. So, but I do know that if you go back to the Old Testament, the shackle shelf is to consist of 20 dirhams. Uh, in Exodus, this is what everyone who is numbered shall give to the temple, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 dirhams. So we know that that's correct. The last part of it, I can't make heads or tails of it. If you do, please let me know. Okay, the reason they want all of these accurate <coughs> scales is obvious in verse 13 because 
there is a contribution that God expects of his people to offer. Three quarts from five bushels of wheat. Now this will get your mind spinning too. Three quarts from five bushels of wheat and three quarts from five bushels of barley. Which, if you break it down from the three quantities, equals one sixtieth of the dry measure. Don't worry about how you get there. Just on this one, take my word for it. It's one sixtieth. Verse 14, the quota of oil in liquid measure, the first one's dry measure, will be 1% of every core, another liquid measure. The core equals 10 liquid measures, or one standard larger capacity measure, since 10 liquid measures equals one standard larger capacity measure. You got all that? Let me make that make sense for you. It's one out of a hundred, verse 14. I underlined it for you. It tells you what all of that comes out to. The first one is one sixtieth part, verse 13. The second one in verse 14 is only one out of a hundred. And when we get to 15, this is a little easier. And the quota from the flock is one out of, out of every 200 from the well-watered pastures of Israel. These are for grain offerings, burnt offerings, fellowship offerings, to make atonement for the people. This is the declaration of the Lord God. So of the uh, lesser valuable items, the people only have to give 1 60th part in verse 13. The middle one, which is worth a little bit more, you have to give one percent. A little bit less, I'm sorry, percentage-wise. But of uh, something is valuable out of your herd, he only asks for one out of 200. You can see the gradation, gradation there. If you can figure out how those other things line up without, <laughs> good luck to you. Good luck to you. Now, uh, oh, I did find out what a core was in verse 14. It was a deep, round vessel in which they stored olive oil. And so that became another, another measuring quality, quantity. Assuming, of course, that Butch's core is the same size as Charlie's core and the same size as my core. May be, may not be. Do you want to dwell on this any longer? I don't need it. Let's move on. Uh, yeah, I like the way God's Word translated verse 14. You must give 1% of your olive oil and use it to stand in measure. That's what all of that boils down to. Yeah, that's really simple. <clears throat> and wasn't it possible that they were all making their own containers anyway? Sure. And and whatever, however much clay they had, or however much water, whatever. A gallon wasn't a gallon, four wasn't a gallon, a gallon, whatever. It was a system right for abuse. Yeah. Okay? Right for abuse. And this, these verses are designed to hopefully prevent that. Prevent that. Uh, verse uh, 16. <coughs> Let's see. All the people of the land must take part in this contribution for the prince in Israel. Then the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings for the festival, <coughs> new moons, the Sabbaths, for all the appointed times of the house of Israel will be the prince's responsibility. Remember, we just went through all the contributions each person is to make out of his dry measure, out of his oil and uh, wheat, and then out of his oil and then out of his flock. That is so that in verse 16 and 17, the prince will have everything he needs to provide for the sacrifices that the Lord has made his responsibility. 
This is a new system, by the way. It doesn't come from the law of Moses. This is very different. Verse 17, he, the prince, will provide the sin offerings, the grain offerings, the burnt offerings, and the fellowship offerings to make atonement on behalf of the children of Israel. So in verse 16, the priest is going to make a national offering for the people or the nation as a whole on those occasions. Uh, the festivals, the new moons, and the Sabbaths. It's his responsibility to come up with every sacrificial animal, every drink offering, which is usually made up of what? Wine. And every bit of olive oil, with the oil that goes into the uh, grain offerings, the frankincense that goes with the grain offerings, and all of the grain offerings are flour, flour themselves, itself. So he has a large responsibility to provide that all, all of that. So let's get the measurements right because the prince is going to have the responsibility of offering all of these sacrifices on behalf of the whole nation. So we don't want him cheated because if he cheated, he can't do what the Lord expects him to do. Uh, verse 17, the festivals, I understand to be the Passover, and the tabernacles, because the feast of Pentecost is not mentioned in Ezekiel's vision at all. Another major departure. In fact, there's a uh, uh, festival in the, it, it, almost exactly the same time as tabernacles, but it's never named, which is very strange. Okay. Uh, let me see. Not all the way, yeah. And what are all of these sacrifices to do in, make, in verse 17? Why are they being offered? To make atonement. All of you know what atonement means? If you, would, if you offer a sacrifice to atone for your sins, then your sins are removed. Okay? Jesus' blood was an atonement for our sins and is the reason they can be removed. Or it's the agent that removes his blood, removes or atones for those sins that every one of us have created. Uh, and notice that this atoning idea is attached to the sin offering in verse 17, the grain offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship offerings are all for the purpose of removing the sins or making atonement on behalf of the house of Israel. And we're going to stop there tonight. Uh, and by the way, something else is missing that was extremely important under the old law, the day of atonement. Not mentioned at all. Completely left out. Butch? I think I'm very confused. So on the clock. When you started at 13, this is the offering that you shall offer. Okay. And it describes 13, 14, the one sixty-eight. What, what if you didn't have that? Or what if you didn't have 200? Hey, under, under Ezekiel's vision, beginning in chapter 34, around verse 25, there's going to be no famine. The trees are going to put forth. The vines are going to grow like crazy. And you're going to have a land as fertile as the Garden of Eden. So nobody will be short of anything that is required of them. Go back and read chapter 34 or 35, what God's going to do. I believe it's 35. Good question, though. I'm sorry, Uh, that's a good question, and that deserves some consideration. But I mean, I get that this is a vision, but the 
same thing is said with the actual sacrifices and the law of Moses and Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that they are to make atonement. That is a lot. You're getting, I think you're getting close to where I am on it, but we'll look at that. What I want you to do before next week, if you would, is read Hebrews 10. Read Hebrews 10 regarding the last part of verse 15, if you would, please. Any questions that I can answer? Only questions that I can answer. <laughs> Okay, that answers that. There are no questions that I can answer. I got you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day, for the rain that you recently brought us, for all of your blessings. Help us to take these blessings and to always use them wisely. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.